Hello. Hello. You, you are, are listening, listening to, to the, the Carol, Carol Connection. Connection with your, your host, host Jared, Jared Carol. Carol. Hey everybody, welcome to The Carol Connection. I'm your host, Jared Carroll, here to bring you guys another great episode. I did want to take a chance to shout out last week's episode, episode 166 with Nick Lancelotti. Uh, he came on the podcast, he's a project engineer, talked about going through high school, uh, kind of struggling a little bit with his sexuality and coming out to his family and his friends, going to college, finally being able to kind of come out and be the person who he always wanted to be, going through college, then living in New York, and how that's really opened up his eyes uh, to a whole new world. And we got into um, his little bit with activism work and some of the stuff that he's working on with some people out there in New York. And it was a really great podcast. I hadn't seen Nick in about 10 years. So it was like really great to reconnect. And that's always the the great part about this podcast is to connect with people that I was close with uh, growing up. So if you guys want to check out that podcast, check it out at thecarolconnection.simplecast.com. Also available Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the major listening platforms. If you'd like to watch your podcast, go on YouTube, search The Carol Connection, or at Jared M. Carol, and it should pop up right for you. And if you want to be a guest or return as a guest, hit me up on Instagram at Jared M. Carol or at The Carol Connection, and we'll set that up. So that brings me to today, episode 167, bringing a return guest from episode 89 and 47, John Sisto. How are you? Glad to have you back on the podcast, man. I know we had to flex a little bit with the podcast, a little some stuff that happened, but I'm glad that we were able to set aside some time and have some conversation. So like I said, your last appearance was episode 89. Uh, at that time, I was titling episodes. So that episode for your return was uh, being intentional with the way that we do things in life. And that was kind of like the, the theme of that episode. And uh, I kind of steered away from that as I was telling you right before we recorded, but um, that episode was recorded in 2022 around February. So we're about two years removed from that episode. So a lot of stuff has, has happened in your life and you reached out to come on the podcast and kind of talk through some of this stuff that's been happening. And, uh, I'm really interested to kind of dive into this, these topics with you. And it's obviously a great opportunity for us to connect. Uh, so I'll let you kind of start off the podcast with catching people up on kind of like your 2022 and then into your 2023. All right. So 2022 didn't really amount to too much. I uh, I still had the business. I was running the business. What was the business? So um, people that, if they're listening for the first time. So I was doing high-end reconditioning and detailing of cars. Um, I had a lot of Patriots. I had Celtics, Bruins, uh, Red Sox. And then I wound up actually getting Barrett-Jackson Car Show too. So I wound up getting a lot of those clients from the northern of the state that were selling their cars at Mohican Sun. I wound up getting a couple of them and then they just kind of blew up and they would send them to me. I'd recon them. I'd get them prepped, get them all A1, and then they'd pick them up, send them off to the show. So over that year of 2022, you probably saw majority of the cars that could have gone through Mohegan Sun were in East Providence getting recon and getting set and ready to go. So I was doing high-end stuff. They were seeing a lot of my stuff. Um, So I wound up doing that. And then uh, right towards the end of 22, beginning of 23, uh, started having some relationship problems really started to take a toll on everything i wound up getting a bunch of weight back that i've been fighting on and off to lose um i think at this point i've lost 100 pounds about three freaking times i think i'm on my fourth time now i'm about 62 64 down from where i was in march of this year um so i wound up selling it for my health for physical mental um just needed to figure it out and i was lucky enough to be able to be in a position to sell clients sell what i needed off made a ton of money did well and then um <clears throat> i wound up getting into a project manager's position at a remodeling company right into 2023 so i sold everything by january 2nd or 3rd and then rolled right into that job january 25th and then went from there uh 2023 was rough it started off rough the first two months Weren't bad. I was kind of learning the new job, stuff like that. Still trying to deal with what was going on with the relationship issues. Finally, that came to an end and it came to a crash and burn, like really bad crash and burn. Um, I saw things and found things out that I shouldn't have and people shouldn't have. And I did. Um, so that took a really bad mental hit on me. And with everything that I've gone through in the past and the other podcasts you'll hear about, like the fire department, my PTSD, stuff like that. Um, 
this was what made the pot boil over. And I snapped. I actually had a mental snap. I don't think I was manic, but I had a snap really bad. Um, between the breakup, I had, I had to quit my job being a project manager. I couldn't, I'm, I'm the kind of person who I communicate and I talk about my emotions, but I'm not really a crier. That's still something I kind of do by myself when I need to get it out and move along. I was breaking down in the middle of work for no reason at all. So at that point I finally said, you know what? I need to really fix myself. Um, so I left, I left the position I was at. I lived off of the money I had from the business that I sold the business from, lived off that for about six months. And now I am a superintendent at a commercial construction company. Um, I'm working on going into private military contracting to be a medic. I have a few contracts that I'm trying to go forward, drop and wait for. Um, I go to therapy once a week and I feel 10 times better than where I was a year ago. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted to come on because I know what this podcast is about. I know what kind of the following is and it's all about mental health, kind of being true to yourself, self healing, self worth, stuff like that. And I think this past year has been a big, big version of that. And I want to throw my hat in the room and hopefully the stuff I say can help people kind of find their own way and see if it can help them across the line too into 2024. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you reaching back out to connect about this stuff. And I really hope that anyone that listens will hear that and feel comfortable enough to also do the same and, and maybe get something from what you're going to talk about on this episode. Because I always say, <clears throat> you never know what people go through until you talk about it with them or at least ask. And not enough people will ask and reconnect or sit down with someone and just talk about life. And I really tried to spend the time, like even like prior to this podcast when we're just talking and catching up and talking about things. Like I find even like the pre-interview and a little bit of like post interview stuff is it's super important towards the, to this podcast and, and to like reconnecting with people and hearing what you've kind of gone through to get a little grasp of stuff. And without this podcast, who knows if we ever reconnect and stuff and when we see each other and maybe it's passing and stuff like that, but to be able to set aside some time and make it like, referencing last uh, last episode being intentional with the way we spend our time with each other and having more genuine conversations we're not only benefiting each other but hopefully benefiting people that are listening which is the ultimate goal of this podcast is to help benefit people so we'll kind of walk through this methodically with with the way that things have happened so we'll start with this the business and selling of the business how was that emotionally for you because obviously when you were coming on the podcast this was something that was you were really excited about you were really passionate about at the time and to kind of make that pivot is not like a quick thing to do so how was that for you to to pivot from this business and to look towards other other things um well so i really did that because i wanted to I don't know. I, I started noticing really, I started seeing the hours. I started seeing what was going on. It really wasn't the work that was bothering me too, too much. It was kind of, I wasn't seeing the people I wanted to. I really kind of secluded myself. It was me and my ex and uh, a lot. And I think that had a good amount to do with, with a lot of different stuff that may have happened Um, in my defense, not on my end, but that's, I'm not going to jab at that, but um, I started getting lost in work. And it's never really a bad thing, but I started doing that when I was going through a lot of my own traumatic stuff. I would use work as an alias. I would use work as a crutch. And that's never a bad thing because at the end of the day, no matter which way you want to slice it, money is money it may not be the root of all happiness, but it sure as hell helps. And the people who don't who don't agree with that or don't think that, I mean, you're living in a fairy tale. And I hate to say it like that. You don't have to be a millionaire by any means. You can live enough to get by. You can live enough to be able to have what you want, have the nice things or what you qualify as having a good enough life for yourself. But at the end of the day, you need the money. So I've become a lot more money driven over the past few years as well, probably because of me owning a business and stuff like that. But I also know that it helps. You know, it's less stress on you because no matter which way you slice it, you're always going to have a car payment. You know, you're always going to get taxed on shit that falls out of the sky. No matter what, that's at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen. So you need to worry about that. But <clears throat> um, like I said, with the finances and stuff, I started seeing the money. I was like, all right, the money's great. Everything's great, but I'm losing time with my, with my friends, with my family. You know, all my friends are going on these rat, like luscious vacations, and they want to go do a weekend trip here or a 
day trip there or a week cruise or this or that. I'm like, ah, I'd love to, but I have work. And it would come to the extent that I didn't trust anyone to do the work because they could, but also they couldn't. They could do the bulk of it, but when it came down to the meticulous details that I was charging a thousand, fifteen, two thousand dollars for, people couldn't do it. The, the, the employees couldn't do it. So slowly I started to let them go because there'd be no point in paying them and having them do stuff. Even if they were to do the bulky stuff, I'd still have to go through it again anyways. You know, so just do it right the first time kind of thing. So I really kind of secluded myself. I really started just working on my own, focusing on working on my own. And, and it turned into, I don't know, I don't even know. I just got tired quick. Like I said, I started getting more and more stressed, you know. Um, everything kind of fell on me. And if it wasn't on me, then it was my own fault. You know, you, there's no, there's never that crutch like, oh, well, it, it happens. So-and-so didn't do this and it caused this. Not a big deal. It really made you, it really makes you reflect on like what you do. How do I explain it? really makes you reflect on like when things go wrong you have no one else to blame but yourself and that's not always a bad thing but when it becomes repetitive you kind of just you start getting in that in that mindset and it drags you down so you're like to keep working i need to i need to perfect this no matter how much you perfect there's always gonna be something else nothing's cookie cutter and that's kind of the thing you perfect one thing but then you get a next card the next time that you're doing the same thing and there's a scratch that won't come out but it's on a eighty thousand dollar car that's got to go to auction that could sell for a hundred and ten thousand. You gotta make sure this is right. So then you have to do more things, you know. So regardless of the fact I started getting too absorbed with work. Um between that, that made everything else kind of decline. Not only friends and family, my fitness, my health. I started eating like shit. I wasn't going to the gym as much because I go in at six AM. I wouldn't leave until midnight sometimes, you know, and then I have to be at work at eight eight AM the next day. You know, I was just running my I was burning myself out. And then not only did I have that toxic environment in work, when I came home, it would just be toxic there too. You know, I'd want to come home, make dinner, and be a big 300 some on pound, six foot two baby, and cuddle on the couch and watch thriller movies. That wouldn't happen. I'd be seen as a nuisance. I'd be pushed to the side. I'd be ignored blatantly. I'd get a kiss, and that's about it. Not talk about our day, not laugh, not joke, not do anything. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm not getting it from home. I'm not getting it from there. I'm stressed out about work. I get stressed out at home. Oh, I know what to do. I'll just go work. That'll keep my mind busy. But then I'm just stressed there too. So it just, it really became like a, a big ball of just stress and toxic, toxicity, I guess. And I said, finally, you know what? I finally said, you know what? Screw it. I'm in a financial spot that I can get rid of everything. I can sell it, make some damn good money. And I'll just take the next step from there. And who knows, maybe this will help my relationship too because then i'll be working set hours i can go hang out with my friends go hang out with my work friends i'll be able to start working out again maybe all of this combined will kind of take pressure off of the relationship and stuff going on at home be able to balance it out and it didn't it came back to bite me in the ass but i don't regret selling it because the it was it was it's just so much responsibility and i don't think it's a i don't think it's an emotional thing or me saying oh i can't handle the responsibility it was just a lot of fucking responsibility and even more so trying to own a business in this day and age in the, in the state or states we live in, it's impossible. I learned so much about how small businesses get the shit kicked out of them between Rhode Island and mass, the shit kicked out of them. It's ridiculous how bad small, small businesses here get beat up because they're just small and, and the state wants to make taxes and make money off them. Because at least in Rhode Island, we don't have any massive major corporations in the city. Hence, uh, that the uh, Kurt Schilling, that company, you know, that's the kind of they'll they'll usher down to them. But me, I have to and find out a way to hide money, <laughs> you know, or or I okay, I made this much, I can't put that on tax. Let me buy something else, you know. So you don't even get to enjoy yourself, you know. It's still it's still like you're working a nine to five, except you're working for the government at this point, not for yourself. So. It it sucked because it was my baby, and a lot of people knew, like, oh, wow, he's doing really well. He's doing really good. Holy shit. And it was great. I mean, <clears throat> the first year, I was looking at Bentleys to buy, to put on Toro to try to rent them out. I was looking at other business ventures, you know, and I still had that capability, but I just got so burnt out that I stopped worrying about everything else, and I started focusing on the business and growing it and growing it and growing it, but I never sat back and looked at what I grew. And actually been able to enjoy it because I was always inside. I was never outside looking in. I was always stuck inside and I couldn't get out. 
Yeah, and I'm really glad that you've given this perspective. And there's a lot of great points that you, you said here to kind of dive in and, and dissect a little bit. And I think one of the cool perspectives that you were able to gain is, like you said, owning a business, being the owner of a business. And being able to look from that perspective to see how a lot of these taxes work, how a lot of the responsibilities do fall on you. And in, in comparison to just being a worker, if you just doing some of the detailing and you mess something up, it's, oh, it's, it's, I'm just a worker. I, I just work here versus when it's you, you own the business. It's your responsibility to deal with the customer and work a way to figure out how to, how to handle this now. And that just adds more stress to the environment. And even going to the point of using work as a crutch, I think that it's a good, good uh, sentiment to kind of talk about here because a lot of people will dive into their work and use that as their way to kind of like rebel against society and rebel against what's going on in their life to avoid things that they're dealing with. And it's everyone has something, whether some people want to do video games, whether some people like the gym, whether some people like eating, whether some people like working, whatever it is, um, we all have some type of vice that we like to get away from the stresses of our, our reality. And having work be that can also be a really good thing. And it sounds like obviously you're talking about the finances and like there's good aspects of it. But then as you went through it repeatedly and repeatedly, it adds that added stress where things become very, very difficult. Exactly. And that's where I think the take home message here with that too, is like, you got to understand like what works for you and what doesn't. It's not that you weren't capable of doing it. It becomes a point. Do you even want to do this anymore? And you have enough like self-awareness to see that it's not working for you at this time and know what works for you and to kind of remove yourself from a situation. And luckily for you, you're, you're in a position to sell the business and make some profit on it and to, to obviously live off it. Unfortunately, why you lived off it, we'll dive into in a second. But like having that ability to do that is a privilege that you've earned because you put in the work to do so. And on top of that, everything that you we've talked about in prior episodes and just like off record and going probably on this podcast throughout your life, you've been able to do a lot of things successfully, but you've also gone through stuff to do those things successfully and learned from those things that, that maybe didn't go your way back then. And to continually add that to what you are as a person and what you're going for and striving for. Like for resume. Yeah. And it's, it's being able to, you're just diverse in what you do to have all these different life skills is super valuable. And I think it's really great to hear that you've been able to, to try these different things and being able to say that you owned a small business is a great thing. And the fact that you could go off that for as long as you want is awesome because you can create something. You have that mindset now and you've seen the result now that you can look back on it and see that thing was successful. And exactly. that carries carry you into whatever you do next. And that kind of seems like where you are now where you have options. You have plenty of options to where you want to go because you have kind of dipped your hand in multiple different cookie jars and successfully done that. So now you can pick where you want to go. And I think that's really great for people to see and hear that you don't have to be such a one dimensional person and you could always pivot. Yep. I think that's super invaluable for especially people, especially in this like twenties to like forties, like you could always pivot. Life's about pivoting. Oh yeah. oh yeah. No. And honestly, that's actually, I even notice that now. So obviously I'm, I'm just getting back into the, the dating pool. And really what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm meeting women, you know, the bar working at the bar is a very helpful thing. I'm on a couple of apps, stuff like that. But I, <clears throat> um, like the women that I've met in the past to the one that I'm seeing now and, and everything like that, they're in their thirties, they're in their forties, you know, like prime example, the one I'm seeing right now, she's 35. She has a beautiful little two-year-old. She's getting her master's in occupational therapy, 35 years old. She's in, cl- uh, she's in school, you know, she's used the military. She's a vet, uh, air force vet. She used it to her advantage. She's able to afford nice housing, like nice, nice, a nice apartment, um, free school, free utilities for school. You know, she's, she's been able to, and even where she's working part-time right now while she's waiting to get her master's, the VA, she's using the tools that she's been given to do that. You know, um, women I was talking to in the past, there was another one. She was like 32, 33. Um, she was a school teacher. She left, went into um health care equipment sales and she's just saving money to go into something else you know like you said you, one dimensional you don't you never have to and i i 
the dates I've gone on in the past and the people I've met, like guys, girls, and different. Oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a superintendent at a construction company. Nobody would ever think that I'm construction management, that I'm a white collar worker. If you see me in a t-shirt and stuff, I sure as hell don't look it. I'm covered in tattoos. I'm a monster of a man. I look like someone who just moves shit all day, but I don't anymore. Now I sit in a nice desk and I watch everyone do it. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that doesn't fit you. I was like, yeah, well, I'm new into it. They're like, oh, what'd you do before? Oh, I was a firefighter. Oh, I owned a small business. Oh, I was a bodyguard for, for select celebrities. You know, I've done all that from like 21 to where I am now. I've had like three or four major career changes. And they're like, oh, like, isn't that a bad thing? And I was like, why? Like, why is that a bad thing? I was never financially broke during that time frame. I was able to afford my bills, able to afford what I do, you know, still able to live a nice lux- lifestyle. I have, I have nice things. I have a nice vehicle. Now I live, I rent, I split a house with, with a roommate, you know, doing that kind of stuff. I have a dog again now somehow, but like I was never, I was never a bum. I always had something. Yeah, I did career changes. And if, and when people say, oh, like that's not a good thing. Why is it not a good thing? I'm just diversifying what I'm doing because now like the firefighting, like I said before, now I can roll into private military contracting me owning a business like oh, for medical for, for that aspect. But me owning a business got me into becoming a project manager and becoming a superintendent because I have time management skills. I have employee management skills and on the layman's terms of aspects, I have budgeting skills. Like, Oh, why, why I just had to take down today. Prime example. I had, I had to remove a wall that I just built because it wasn't right. And that's a whole nother can of worms, but okay. I could be a Neanderthal and just rip everything apart. No, I'm going to do it instead of having my subcontractors do it, who are just going to rip it apart because they can just go buy more. I'm going to carefully take down all the drywall, took down all the studs, took down the two by sixes of like pure fucking Oak that were like a hundred pounds. I'm going to do all that. I put them to the side. Nice, nice. So that when we fix the issue that is there, and we can put the wall back up, we're going to use the same material. We're not going to have to worry about spending more money on material or having to battle it out with the subcontractors of who's going to pay for the material. I saved it. It's fine. We'll use it again. You know, it's just so just different aspects. And I did the same thing when I owned the business. I wound up budgeting, not even budgeting, but I conserved the material I used, my cutting compound, my spray, my this, my that. I water a little bit of it down so it would last longer, but it still did the job. You know, stuff like that. It's just different. Just because you have one career doesn't mean you can't carry it over into another. So you can always, if you don't like something, make sure you have a backup plan. Make sure it's worth the money that you're going to spend or you're going to make and do it. You know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I see it too often. I see friends and I'm sure you've seen it too, especially in, in your career. And before we were talking on the podcast, you even said it. You were like, I refused a promotion. Because I like the money I'm making, I'm happy with the job I'm at, and I want to, I can have my cake and eat it too. I can make the money I want, I'm still financially comfortable, and I can still dedicate my time to my hobbies and things I like. You can do that with a job too. Like, okay, I like what I'm doing, I want to switch it up, I want to do something different that's in the same field or have the same kind of base foundation, go do it, you know? It, you can always do that. It's never impossible. Yeah, definitely. And I, I always have been trying to like kind of promote to a lot of people who might be in similar situations as, as me who work in this nine to five lifestyle, you get caught up in this office work life. And, um, it can be very depressing once you're in it post college, especially for the people that have gone to college and gone this route. Yeah. And you kind of have to understand. And I was talking to Andrew Wu who came on recently yeah. about this stuff and you have to know what type of worker you are and what you want out of your life. Exactly. And for the situation that my life is right now, um, adding more to my plate with maybe a little bit more in pay is just not really worth it to me when I really enjoy doing and dedicating a lot of time to this podcast. And I don't want to have extra added stress worrying about stuff at work. I'm not the type of person that wants to bring my work home with me. I want my work to be my work. And everything outside of that is outside of that. And we've gotten into a culture that is really heavy on pushing like, like you should be an entrepreneur. You should be a hustler. You should be a grinder. You should always be working, work as much as you can. And I don't necessarily think that's bad, but I don't think that's most people. I don't think most people are built to be entrepreneurs. I don't think most people are going to be really these grind hustling people. And honestly, 
one of the coolest like TikTok pages I've ever seen is this guy that works a regular nine to five and posts. He does like one of those like uh, things throughout the day. Like he uh, vlogs his day basically of just yeah. living his normal life. Yeah. And it's not to romanticize the life. It's to show that you could just live a normal life. You don't have right. to be like everyone you see on social media or your <laughs> friends doing this or your, your cousin or sibling doing that. Like find what you like to do. And, like you said earlier, money is part of this. Money is part of the equation. You have to understand that we live in a capitalist society. It is what it is. Like money is just incorporated into this. You need to figure out a way to earn the most possible money to enjoy the life that you want to enjoy. But it, exactly. But that's the thing. It's capitalistic right there in plain English. Yeah, it's capitalistic and people find problems with that, whatever the case is. You, <clears throat> the younger, the, our generation and the kids younger than us, younger than us now, they go on this high horse of, oh, I'm going to choose my own destiny. I want to choose what I'm going to do. I'm going to be such and such a thing. I'm going to, I want to be happy and I want to work four days a week, 10 hour days. And then I want to spend three days learning how to knit. Okay. You can do that. You have the opportunity now to learn how to knit on the side and then start selling it. So then you turn your hobby into something profitable. You're in charge of your own destiny, but you're going to use it to make money. That's being a, that's going to, that's being an entrepreneur. That's being capitalistic. That's the luxury that we get with our lifestyle, with where we are now, that no matter which way you slice it, there's always a way to make money. You can always do it. I started my detailing on the side of being a firefighter and I did it by myself. I was doing it to my own vehicles. I realized, wow, I really like doing this. Somebody said, wow, and that's the time I had the Audi. They're like, oh, wow, your car looks really nice. Can, can you do mine? I'm like, yeah. What do you want? Oh, I don't want anything. Give me like 50 bucks. Oh, okay, cool. And it just went from there. But it started as a hobby, you know, but hobbies can turn into anything you want them to turn into. You can just do it on the side and live your life and still be able to work your normal nine to five. And then your hobby can turn into something beneficial, you know, but that's the thing. Either way, money's the root of all evil. You're going to need to make it one way or the other. So do it. Absolutely. And I think that's where a lot of people get caught up in, in the weeds of things when it comes to passions and careers and all these things. At the end of the day, you need money to do whatever. Exactly. It's like none of the stuff here in this room would be here without me having money. Exactly. Like, and I had to work. I found a career that worked for me that I was able to use my skills with numbers and stuff like that to benefit me in a, in a way that was positive and in a, in a, in an environment that was conducive to what I like to do and being, I'm very introverted. I don't want to deal with a bunch of people. And I found a career that, that suits me and has a routine base to it. And I think that's important. Like I said earlier, to, to know yourself enough to know what you are comfortable doing. Cause at the end of the day, like if you don't do something, you're just going to be broken, homeless and upset. Like exactly. you don't want to go down that path where you're just constantly trying to be something like, you got to stick to something for a little bit, yeah. earn the money, and then do something else. Like you said, like there's always a way to like pivot on things, and exactly. it's never too late to pivot on things. And I think a lot of people really need that advice because, especially in the times that we live in now, where things are so chaotic financially and in terms of the career force and education, like a lot of especially these younger kids, I feel for them because like you look at college, you're like is it really worth it anymore? Between the education, the dollars, and then you're like, well, what do I do? And you know what the funny thing that I, I've been seeing like. I definitely promote blue collar jobs and I think it's a great thing, but I think it's funny that people who promote it the most are people who would never do it. Exactly. Oh yeah. And I'm like, I was, I saw something the other day, someone was sh like, like we should promote blue collar jobs the way that we promote education. But it's like the people that would never do blue collar jobs ever. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's funny how that is. And like, obviously I'm someone who's not blue collar saying it's a good thing. And I agree it's a good thing, but like, I'm also like, I would, wouldn't do it. But if I had to do it, I would do it. I mean, I've done like, wheels and tires and I've worked in, in um, at Butler Hospital doing some like stuff on the units like I've done handy stuff I wouldn't consider myself a handy man yeah. but like push came to shove I would do it like I mean yeah. it is what it is and I'll, I mean I'll be honest I've completely fallen into the into the white collar lifestyle now now that I do it I used to do the oil on my truck I don't want to anymore my back hurts it sucks getting underneath it I spend the same amount of money doing the oil change of my diesel than I would have in somebody doing and that's the sad part is it's actually like only like twenty dollar difference, so I'm not even saving that because I can't even put that in my fucking tank. Because you're saving time now. Exactly. Now I'm saving time to go do what I want to do and be able to relax a little bit. I've taken relaxing to a whole new level. Now I'm I'm very into just. Well, 
relaxing. I get home. I hang out with the dog because the dog follows me around now. Hang out with the dog, take a shower, go downstairs, make dinner, do the dishes, go upstairs, relax, lay in bed on my phone, hang out with the dog because the dog loves to cuddle. It's a 105-pound German Shepherd. <laughs> he just follows me around and he loves to hang out and cuddle. I lay on the bed, he plops on my chest and I rub him and watch TV or watch something on my phone. That's what I do. But going back to what you said about how the education stif- stuff, this, that, and the other, learning, like seeing what I've done so far in life now, trade school, obviously I'm fully support trade school. I've been blue collar. I've always done blue collar. You know, um, even firefighting stuff, I consider it extremely blue collar, even though I have to get the medical certificates we've gotten out of it and the medical background I've gotten out of it. But what I've realized here is even, even if you're a white collar person, Depending on what job you go into, you can do the same thing that a blue collar does. Because at the end of the day, the people who don't do blue collar work don't understand. But how blue collar jobs work is the more experience you get, you'll never leave the job until you go into a foreman and go into like you said, like managerial stuff. But if you want to stay being a worker, being a laborer, let's say a carpenter, you start out as an apprentice base pay, send in, you wait a few years, you get your license, you're like, okay, do I want to stay with this company? What's the price like? 30 an hour. That's not bad. Oh, what's this place? 35 an hour. Okay, what's this place? 42 an hour. Oh, shit, okay, go to there. Like, okay. Then before you know it, every few years, and I've seen it with my father firsthand because my dad drove truck. He's a, he still is a truck driver now to this day. He followed the money. He would follow the money wherever he went. You can do that even in a white-collar job. You can, you can do it and you can jump fields. You know, like I said, I, w- I've had like one of the kids that worked with me, he was a PM for like Wayfair. They just sell furniture apparently with kids in it. I don't know, but, <laughs> but they Wayfair kid hopped over into construction management because he has the experience with, with, with mill work. So he hopped from one end to the other and he's making, I think he said it was like, even it's something small, like ten or fifteen thousand dollars more a year, but that's still like what I think like two hundred bucks paycheck now, something like that. Okay, yeah. that's still something. That's still something. But he's doing it. You know, he he hopped he hopped fields. He went from PM work of pretty much retail, but because he had a good sturdy background of mill work, he hopped into construction management, and now he is a whiz at mill work, and he's learning everything else as he goes. You know, you can always switch around, so you never have to stay stuck in one position. I think that's kind of the stigma of, like, the same thing, how it's a comparison of white collar not being able to go into a different field and learn something new and be able to diversify what they do compared to a blue collar never being able to get out and make the money they think they deserve. There's a way out of it. You just have to take your time and and see. My dad went from driving dump trucks making dog shit, then he... Save, 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 got his certifications or save, 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 got the experience. And he started driving gas trucks like for mobile and stuff. Massive pay raise because they paid for him to get the cert too. So, but the experience he had of moving around the dump trucks or doing something he wasn't supposed to at one of the jobs he did for a short period of time because they needed the help, he learned how to do it. He was able to get his cert and go from there. You know, he was able to jump around. And I think that's kind of the thing that nobody really gets is that, Everybody thinks once you're locked in something, you're locked in it for life. Like, that's all you're good at. And yeah, maybe if you're like a painter, like someone who paints like walls, like in commercial residential buildings, maybe you'll never be able to diversify what you do because all you do is paint. But that's not true. Like a landscaper, landscapers, everyone thinks that they just cut grass. Landscapers, I know many landscapers that are borderline arborists that know so much shit about trees and bushes and flowers and mulch and A, B, C that... If they wanted to, they could, they can go into anything. They can go into anything. They can open up, they can go into tree work. Tree work is more money. They can go into, um, like, landscape designer or something like that. You know, there's endless opportunities of what you can do. It's just you have to pick and choose what information. You have to know how to word it. You have to put it together pretty on a resume, and you can do it. Like I said, I've never done construction management, commercial construction management. I have zero experience in it. I got this job making extremely good money that I never thought I'd get because I worded everything right and because I had certain skills that are attractive and I was able to roll into something else and I got an opportunity and I took it and I'm doing okay. 
Yeah, I think it's also part of it too is like being willing to start fresh, being willing to oh, not yeah. know everything. Oh, yeah. Like, because everyone wants to be, once you're in a position and you've done something for so long, the fear of starting over is scary as fuck. Yeah. You don't want to just rip it all up and be like, fuck, it, I'm going to do something else because what I'm doing right now isn't satisfying. And people will get stuck in that mindset. And I could totally empathize and understand that mindset. But it's the, because as you get older, the possibility of change becomes scarier and scarier oh, yeah. because you got more responsibilities. Life is just life. You got to, you got stuff you're going to have to take care of and uh, to make that pivot and to go into a stressful environment for a little bit when you don't know something is overwhelming. And, but you have to be able to do that if you want to make serious changes in your life. And my, my favorite saying uh, from kind of like mid 2023 20, into this year is this motto of nothing changes if nothing changes. If you're going to constantly bitch and complain about stuff and you want something different to happen in your life, you have to change something. Cause if you're doing the same thing over and over, what is that definition of insanity? insanity yeah. And you're just going to keep running into that same wall. Exactly. So you have to make something, you have to change something in your life to, to make that change. And that's something that I've really kind of taken to heart this past year. And even into this year, as we continue is, how can I change my life to produce something better? Obviously, I haven't talked about the project that I'm working on. I just call it the project. Yep. But I knew I wanted something different in my life. I wanted to add something to my life. So what did I have to do? I had to do something different. And it, it requires you removing yourself from your comfort zone and, and chasing that that idea that you have in your head. Like we all have ideas. We all have visions, I would hope. And you just got to like go for it. Like I know it's cliche and corny to talk about, but this this idea of pursuing something bigger than yourself is real. And part of this podcast and this platform and for us to connect and talk about this stuff is important to show that like we're just everyday people that just live, live in life and we created something. We, we do things. And this podcast has showed so many great people that do so many cool things. Hopefully that people in their lives and maybe some random person that listens that gets something from it and decides to go do something that they want to do. And that's the overall purpose and why we talk about these things and why they're super valuable. I do want to take a chance to, to pivot a little bit in this conversation and talk about uh, some of the mental health and relationship stuff that you were, we were kind of talking about. Obviously, yeah. whatever you're comfortable with. Oh, yeah. But I felt like that piece was a real factor in what we talked about in 2023 and how uh, it dictated and obviously what you're talking about was selling some of the business because some of this toxicity at home um, was infiltrating your life and how you felt and this emotional break kind of that you were talking about um, allow you to kind of go into more detail as much as you feel comfortable with, obviously, and we'll, we'll talk through this. So so for like the, la the last year of the relationship, it got, it got bad, you know? Um, intimacy was gone. Um, there wasn't really much, much connection whatsoever. Completely backed off, and like I said, I there had to be something going on. We discussed that, you know. There had to be something from what all the signs pointed to. There was something going on. I didn't want to believe it. I trusted. I gave full faith, et cetera, et cetera. Um, out of nowhere, it just happened. I was like, okay, I have to get all my shit out. You know, a lot of immaturity was involved, um, and a lot of Vanishing, refused to see me, refused to talk to me, didn't want to be near me, wouldn't, wouldn't see me in person. You know, the last time I saw her in person was the day she left. I saw her in the morning because I wanted to see her a little bit before I went to work and started my day. Uh, that happened. So kind of went ghost on me. Um, I started wigging out. I was like, oh, shit. So I let her family know, be like, hey, I don't know what the hell happened, but it happened. Like, I'm sorry. They were no help, which they say they wanted the best, but they wouldn't help with anything. So I was like, okay, well, they probably knew that something was going on too. So whatever, backed off, just tried to scramble and start really trying to like shut down and figure out what was going on with me. And um, three weeks later, I was driving by to go home and I saw some things going on with her 30 year senior coworker at the job that I, me and my father helped her get. And I saw that firsthand. And I planned on doing some things that I'm not proud of, but I didn't. I went home and I just kind of took the hit to the chin and I tried to process it and do that. Made some communication. We talked. She lied. Um, I didn't tell her that I saw it. I told her that somebody uh, told me or advised me that something happened. And uh, I was able to get my answers. 
um, through odds and ends, through mutual people, stuff like that. And like I said, it, it just made me snap to the point. I So I was like, okay, I was trying to figure it out. Like the first three weeks until I saw what happened, I was like, okay, I'm getting through it. I'll be okay, et cetera. And then I saw what I saw and I found out what I found out. And I said, okay. And I just snapped. Um, wasn't thinking right. Wasn't sleeping right. I wasn't eating right. When I get stressed, I don't eat. So I stopped eating. I was living on chewing tobacco and coffee. You know, occasionally I would eat something if I could force it down, whether it was toast or yogurt or something. Um, and it really affected my mental. Like I said, I wasn't focusing. I wasn't processing. I wasn't going through the day. I was just kind of mute the entire time. And then I leave work and I just go home and I sit and I think about it. Um, like I said, came to the extent that even like simple altercations or like simple like disciplinary things at work because something happened that was no more than like a, hey man, I uh, forgot to do this. Breakdown out of nowhere. And it made no sense and it scared me a lot because I felt like I was losing control of myself because there's a lot, I take pride in being able to control myself on many different aspects. And like I, like you said, I'm, or at least from what I've, I feel too, I'm very self-aware of myself. I'm very self-aware of my emotions, my mentality, my physicality. You know, I'm always very aware of my surroundings and everything. And I felt like I was losing control and I was on a train that I couldn't stop or I couldn't slow down. And that's when I finally sat there. I said, you know what? I need help. Thankfully, I never had a thought of taking my own life or anything like that. I knew that wasn't an option. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Not, of course, obviously not making anyone who had those thoughts to discriminate, like to kind of lowball them but i was like i can't do that that's not an option to me um so i wound up going into therapy i said i need to go to therapy and figure it out and uh i went into therapy i started two days a week and then after five months or so i went down to one day a week and as of now i'm actually taking a month off because i can't stand their payment system and they keep fucking me over out of money randomly throughout the week. It's just like a random bite on the ass. I'm like, oh, cool. I lost. Like a, I don't have $120 in my account that I thought was there, you know, and that messes with my budgeting. Um, But like I said, the main reason why I wanted to get come on this podcast is because obviously it's mental health. And obviously everyone talks about the from what I've watched and what I've listened to. A lot of people have talked about most of the good things. You know, I know um, Adam last week, you talked about like the stress and the struggle and the fear of coming out and being able to talk and like, no, um, Andrew, Andrew. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so like seeing how Andrew was able to overcome that fear and overcome that, that mental and emotional stress to be able to come out and realize that it all turned out for the better. You know, you don't see a lot of people really coming, coming on and talking about major, major things. And when they do, it's just talking about major things, how it helped them. And then, how they're doing now. I wanted to come on and talk about why you really need to do them. You need to, because I didn't think I needed to. And like we talked about pre podcast, I don't think this breakup is what did it to me. I think it was everything else that's happened in my life. This was the final traumatic incident that overflowed the cup. And it came to the extent that I thought I was in full control. When you, the scariest thing is, when you think that you're in full control and then you find out you're not, that's scarier than being on the fence of if you are or not. Having the confidence to say, no, I'm good. And then you see, oh, fuck, I'm not good. That's to me 10 times scarier because you, you should know your body. And if your body is pulling out Uno reverse cards out of nowhere, it's like, nah, man, you're not. Like, oh, you left the coffee pot on and somebody told you that, you're going to cry. What? It's like, I'm. John, I'm 6'2", 350. I've been through hell and back. I've seen some fucked up shit. And I'm, I started tearing up because I fucked something up at work that isn't a big deal because I left the coffee pot on. You know, that's what made me realize, like, okay, I'm not, I'm not in control. And that scared me even more because that made me think, oh, shit, am I in control of anything? Is the, are the things that I was, the things that I thought about doing and the things I was capable of doing, was that just sheer fucking luck or did I actually have control? That's the shit that really scared me and really made me like, okay, I need to, I need to figure this out. I need to get help. I did. And I found out I was in control. It was just, there were things that were just happening that it was just a trigger response. It was looking for a reason to happen. 
And it was something minuscule like that for it to happen. And that's what I really kind of sat and I had to spend time and really kind of process and work on myself. And that's why, like a lot of people, I wasn't on social media too much. I wasn't hanging out with friends too much. I have a picture of my niece, my best friend's kids, my best friend's daughter. I didn't get the opportunity to see her being born. I didn't get the opportunity to hold her because of this incident. And now I get to see her. I'm actually in her life. She comes and sees me at work. We go do things. I'm Uncle Sisto. You know, I was there for her first birthday. You know, now I'm able to do these things, but I'm still pissed that I didn't, I lost all that. I lost six months. I lost eight months of it, you know? And yeah, she may not be my blood. She's my best friend's. Or him and my other best friend, who's his wife, their daughter, but still that took a toll too, you know. So I want I want to be able to tell people that it doesn't matter how tough you are, how think how tough you think you are, and it doesn't matter how much control you have. Fair warning: if something hits you hard enough, you're not, and you need to go get it fixed immediately because if not, you're going to lose out on those kind of opportunities that we also pulled into the same loop at the beginning of the podcast talking about working too much, trying to find crutches instead of fixing the problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say I appreciate you for wanting to come talk about these things because these are the conversations that move the needle when we talk about, especially men's mental health. Okay. Like, And that was something that I talked on uh, my episode with Nick Lancelotti on was he was kind of like appreciating the fact that even the conversation I had with Andrew was talking about having these vulnerable conversations these things of getting in touch with almost like almost kind of like this spiritual aspect and energy to be have that we have to our to our bodies and to who we are and what we feel because no matter like you said no matter what we all have a breaking point your breaking point might be way further than my breaking point but you still have a breaking point is the point and not being willing to accept that we all can use a hand every once in a while especially when it comes to processing things especially for someone who in in your shoes who's gone through a shit ton of traumatic things like you've gone through a lot and all it takes like you like we talked about pre podcasts right here is that one thing to really push it over to overflow the cup and when that cup's overflowing there's no way to put the water back in the cup exactly. you can't do that that's where you have to reach outside to have someone help you empty that cup because yeah. that cup shouldn't ever get the chance to overflow but exactly. we're not also taught these tools growing up and there's not a shot at older generations, not a shot at our parents, their grand, our grandparents, whatever. They didn't know how to do this either. So this is something very new to our society where we're processing not only a lot of our trauma, but generational trauma. There's stuff there that, that's not meant for us to carry that we're carrying. They're, they talk about trauma and things like this. This could be kind of some hippy-dippy shit, but being transferred through genetics. There's a lot of stuff that can be transferred through genetics, and there's stuff that we're just carrying that's not ours. And it requires us going back to the self-awareness point, being self-aware enough to check those things and to go inwards. And going inwards is one of the scariest fucking things you could do because there's no one in this world that's going to help you deal with your shit other than you. Exactly. You have to do it. And there's no one else here that knows you more than yourself and half the time you don't want to admit that you know yourself because sometimes you'll be disgusted or not disgusted. I don't want to go that far. Maybe in some instances, but you may not be happy with it. You know, there's things that you can kind of brush under the rug. And not think about, but then one day you'll be thinking about it, you're like, oh fuck, you're like shit, like that was, that was wrong, that was bad, that was scummy, that was incorrect, da 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 da, and that was kind of my biggest thing. Like when this all happened, my grandmother and my grandmother's been my everything. My grandmother's been taking care of me all the time, and um, <clears throat> when this started happening, she's like, John, what the hell's going on with you? Like, Grandma, I have anxiety. I can't, like, I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. Da 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 da, and she didn't understand. I said, I started going to therapy. She's like, why are you spending that much money? I was like, because I have to. And finally, she really got the understanding when <clears throat> one day she was like, oh, I think that's stupid. And I said, Grandma, I was like, let me, I was like, let me kind of tell you something. I was like, do you remember, do you remember when I would come home from bad calls? And I'd have bad calls, really bad calls on the fire department. I'd come home and you knew that I had a bad call because I came in the house. I didn't say anything. I gave you a hug and I started making breakfast for myself. Or I take the breakfast that you already made, knowing I was coming home. Yeah, I said, what would you come up and say to me? She'd come up to me, she'd sit down, and say, "Everything okay?" And I say, "We have a bad call." She's like, "Oh, yeah, you're good. Uh, we'd have a bad call." 
and you would go, oh, and I'd start to tell you what happened, and you would say, well, I don't want to hear it, and walk away. Yeah. That's why I need therapy. I said, because you don't want to hear it, which is fair. It's fine. People can't, some people can't process it, or they don't understand it, or they don't want to think about it, and that's fine. But that's why I'm in therapy, because you can't handle it. You, you didn't have an avenue in what, the 70s, the 80s. You didn't have an avenue um, to find mental health or to figure out mental health. And like, like her, her history was my grandfather, her, her now late husband. He was not very nice. He was not a nice, he was an old school Italian, not very nice man. And even to me and my father, he wasn't very nice. And my grandmother dealt with it for 50 years, 55, 52. And I remember why, because that's what you did. Okay, fair. I respect, I respect the, the rock solid stand down, like stand hard on your, on your feelings, but that's why I need therapy. You know, I can act like a rough and tough man all I want, but at the end of the day, I'm still going to need help. And I think that's, I think that's the issue now with like our generation where we're at is because you have one side who are like, oh, I'm a man. I don't need anything. I'm alpha. I'm, I have my confidence, my masculinity, my dominance, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have guys on the left who, what's, what's the word? Like they're, like they're simpy now. They're, they're too feminine to be able, like they do nothing but talk about their emotions and they don't nut up and say, okay, well, this sucks. I'm in this situation. I can either blubber about it or I can do something about it. There's no in between anymore. You can be masculine, dominant, confident, but still be emotional, open, supporting, and in need of care and help. You know, it's not a bad thing that you, and yeah, you know, honestly, it's come to the time. It's come to the time now that there is stigma that like women don't find that attractive, but you'll find the right girl that you can act like a tough motherfucker during the day. You can act like a tough motherfucker with her out and about. But then when you go home and you really just don't feel like it, you can be the fucking little spoon or something. That's a possibility. And nobody knows that. They think it's like, oh, I have to wear the pants or I'm going to be a puss. You know, and I think that's the biggest problem now is that nobody can multitask it or nobody knows a fine line between it. Absolutely. And that's something that we all have to go through in our lives to understand too. Like growing up, um, I was definitely raised on the whole traditional masculinity, like don't cry, like don't be a bitch, all that other stuff through sports and whatever. And through this podcast and through my own emotional struggles with whether it's dating or losing family members, I fell too much into that emotional side where everything was emotional. Eric, Cause like you bottle up, bottle it up for so long. Then I stumbled into, Oh, I could just express it. So I expressed it to the limit. And it wasn't until I got into therapy where I was able to talk through this stuff and understand, yeah, there are moments in my life where, you, like you said, nut up, get up, like do it. You have to do things sometimes, but it's also important to have that space where whether it's a friend, a family member, your significant other, whatever, a therapist, to have that space to just be like, yeah, today sucked. I really went through a really tough time. I think part of the reason is yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Like you need that space to process your own emotions because if you aren't, processing things you're storing it and what happens when you store it it builds it builds and it gets to that point like we said it overflows and you don't want to overflow onto your loved ones when you start bleeding onto your loved ones and they start seeing that trauma start to pour out in negative ways no one's going to want to be around you and you're going to be wondering why but being that awareness part where we keep referencing that is being able to, to check these emotions and break past the stigma of, especially for men, is having these difficult conversations of like, yeah, I struggled. I went to a therapy. I talked to a therapist. And you know what? It fucking helped. Like, <clears throat> therapy works if you want it to work. Exactly. And it's about how you make it work. You know, and I think that's, and honestly, I think that is out of the whole relationship the whole previous relationship i was in i will admit and i did i i wa i stepped up to the plate <clears throat> in my own process because i never talked to her about it because there was nothing to talk about she it happened what happened but um i know i'm confident that i also went to therapy not only to fix myself but also to prepare myself on what i need to do if i was to get back into the dating proceeding again and get back into a relationship with someone and like I said, I know for a fact that where I was wrong was exactly that. I expressed too much. I smothered her because how I am, I'm a fixer. 
I see something's not right with you, I want to know why. Especially because I know how the other person is, and they're going to like a duck's ass in water, and they're not going to talk. And so you have to you have to pick, you have to pry. And then I would get so anxious and nervous because I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm dealing with this at work. I can't have this at home. What's wrong? What's wrong? Talk to me. Da, 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 da. And it was just, that's what I did. I just smothered in that aspect. Do I, I know it wasn't the best thing to do. Do I regret it or do I feel sorry for it? Absolutely not because at the end of the day, I was reacting to her actions. So you know, it's one of those things that you have to, you have to split down the middle. You got to start splitting hairs. But you have to figure out where you're wrong and you have to figure out how you're affecting others. But you also have to admit, say, okay, I'm wrong. But the reason why I'm wrong is because of this. I'm reacting, I'm reacting to a reaction. Is it right? No. But that's when you start figuring out, okay, how can I, how can I change it? If me changing it, will it affect her reaction differently or his reaction differently? That's the kind of shit that you need to... That's the maze <clears throat> that you have to follow through in life when it comes to significant it others, friends, or family is any kind. And that's what I, I take that to the table now. Anybody, my friends, girls I, I've seen, you know, family, I'll get pissed. We'll get in a fight or there'll be something wrong. I'll sit there and analyze and say, okay, why is this like this? Okay. So-and-so said this. That pissed me off because of this, this, and this. But I shouldn't have done A, B, and C. But if they didn't do it this way, I wouldn't have done it that way. Let me see if I can change how I would how I'll respond the next time and take it from there. You know, it's just it's a it's a back and forth game. And I think it is complicated. And I haven't really found a simpler way to do it. But the complicated way that I'm doing it, or it's not complicated to me anymore, it makes it a lot easier to really understand and process problems and become aware of the fact of, hey, so and so's a dickhead for acting like this, but my reaction wasn't perfect either. So I can't blame I can't blame their reaction or my reaction from the That person might not be someone you want to associate with, and it, and it becomes acknowledging that pattern, those reactions to those actions, what actions align with your actions, and finding the right person that will create that space that you're talking about where you could, in public, in, in your relationship, have that dominant figure, but also be that soft emotional side where you need to be. And I think as someone who's struggled in that aspect as well, I have found someone that, that allows me that space to just be me. Like, I don't have to try to be ultra super dominant all the fucking time. Like, I don't have to do that. Exactly. And and I can just be me. And it requires, and this is goes into a lot of the conversations I've had recently in terms of manifestation, when you bring that word into the table and what you want in a relationship and how you want your relationship to be, it's letting go of that. Letting go of what you can and can't control. Letting go of wanting that relationship because things will naturally flow when you let them naturally flow. So you can't force things to be. And I was definitely someone like yourself where you, you, you want the answer. You want to fix. You want to solve. I'm definitely like that. And you, you smother but not on purpose. Exactly. You want to help so bad and you care so much that you'll do whatever it takes to try to solve it. Exactly. But – that's not everyone's love language. That's not how they receive love. And some people, it goes into the, the traumas they have, the emotional things that they need to fix. And you can't fix those people because they need to fix their own. And it, it just goes into that cycle. But going back to the overall point, it's checking your reactions, checking your emotional triggers, checking what you're dealing with inside. And once you take that task or take walk up to the plate in that aspect and deal with those problems, then you could go back into the quote-unquote dating pool or go back to dealing with your friends or your family or, or whatever situation that you're involved in that's causing these heavy emotions. And I think this this topic or this part of the, the, the conversation with mental health is so valuable because these conversations are not happening every single day. People are just really just pushing it in. So I really do appreciate the fact that you've been willing to kind of just share this stuff because it's, it's unorthodox in the way that society – you as mental health specifically with men. So I think this has been like really great. And I think, and I think that's another like major thing too, is because like I said, you, do you know, so saying I'm in, I'm in therapy because I was, I was like uh, women, I'd be chatting with, Oh, what are you doing right now? Oh, I'm on my way to therapy. And they're like, what? 
problem. I'm like, therapy. And they're like, you go to therapy? I was like, yeah, I do. They're like, oh, well, I've never had a man like say that. I'm like, well, I'm going to go sit down with someone and shoot the shit for an hour about how fucked up I am. Like, it's not, it's not really a, like a, I don't know how to explain that. It's like, not a big deal. You can do the same thing with your friends. We're doing it right now. Are, are you a, are you a certified therapist? No. I'm not. So, like, we're we're in therapy right now with each other. Just shooting the shit, kind of getting feelings off our chest and, and talking and breaking down and making our brain work to figure out what our pros and cons are and shit like that. Pre-podcast, we did it, and I'm sure post-podcast, we'll do it for a short period of time. You know, therapy doesn't have to be with a therapist. Or a lot of people don't understand that therapy isn't just going down to sit down with a therapist. Therapy is going fishing. Therapy is going for hikes. Therapy is going to the gun range, going up to Maine with my friends and going to a shoot house and training and doing all this military, paramilitary bullshit, you know. Uh, therapy is me going home, making dinner, and hanging out with my roommate's dog that I've stolen, you know. Therapy for you is hanging out with your girlfriend, going to get Taco Bell and laying low. There's multiple different ways of therapy. I just, I might be doing it the smart way or the dumb way by spending $120 a week to go do it. You know, but a lot of people, like you said, the stigma of, of people going to therapy, they think that, oh, go to therapy, you must be weak. Like, no, bro, like, you're sitting there drinking beers with your friends talking about how much you hate your life because your job sucks and your girlfriend called you stupid. You're in therapy with your friends. It's the same thing, except you're just, instead of paying $120 for a session, you're paying like 40 bucks for like six beers. You know, it's the same concept. Yeah, it's 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 just acknowledging that. We all, in some form or fashion, can use someone to listen. Exactly. And just talking about stuff is super beneficial, and I think it's it it, it go it strikes that like primitive, like primal aspect of humans where we just we enjoy the conversation, the art of storytelling, talking about things. Like it's how we've always survived. It's how things get passed on. Storytelling and expressing ourselves, and and I think it's why part of the reason why podcasting exists and why it's so popular is because people enjoy listening to other people talk about stuff. Exactly. And once you're able to crack that code and talk about something that's worth talking about, I think you have a formula for things that are really positive. And I try to create the platform where uh, the ther- the mindset is therapeutic, where it might not be quote unquote professional therapy, but where I try to create the the space where it's a place that you can come and talk about stuff. And that's what you exactly what you did. And I appreciate the fact that you took me up on that offer in terms of creating that platform. And this is your third time. And I look forward to every single time that you want to keep coming on and talking about stuff. Cause it's not only a chance to reconnect, but it's also a chance to, to talk about cool stuff and hopefully help people that listen to this podcast. Of course. And literally, like I said, like going back to what I just said, like no matter, there's always something you can do as a form of therapy. Like right now, the way I feel getting ready to end this and to go home and get ready for work is the same feeling I have when I'm leaving, when I was leaving the therapist's office. You just feel that, you know, you just have that weight off of you. And you're like, all right, cool. Like, I really got everything I needed out for the day, even if some bullshit. Like, to be quite honest with you, the last four four months of the eight months, eight and a half months that I was in therapy was really me just showing up, sitting down, and shooting the shit with my therapist. Because I didn't, we handled, like not not that we handled, but we were able to really kind of distinguish all of my problems, and I started instantly feeling better faster, but I'm like, all right, it's good to go. Like you said earlier, routine, having that set up, et cetera, et cetera. It would come to the, I mean, the therapist I have, she's my age. Uh, her dad was a fireman, so we have that connection. Her dad was a fireman right in East Providence. So we have that connection. She knows how to work with them, and... We have the same humor, same personality. Honestly, if she wasn't my therapist, we'd, we'd probably be best fucking friends. You know, we're very laid back, but it's the same man, mentality with no matter what. I bring I bring crumble cookie. Every other week, we bring crumble cookies because it's right next to my, my job site right now. We talked about it one day. I brought the first, and then she brought the next, and then I brought the next, etc. So we just sit there, eat cookies, shoot the shit for an hour, and then I leave. And I feel... 10 times better and I go back to work. I finish the rest of my week and then I go see her the next, the following Monday. Same thing. It's like a, it's like a detox, 
Yeah, and I would say for anyone that has listened to the episode up until this point, we're going to start wrapping things up. But if you haven't tried therapy, I think it's worth trying for anyone that is is listening. So uh, give it a try. If you don't like it, so be it. But just remember, it's kind of like dating, date around. You might need to find a therapist that works for you because it's every person is going to have a different personality and how they deal with emotions. So you have to figure that that out, and it's not always a one time thing. So. Um, I want to give you the chance to say any last words. If you have any last words, I know we've covered a lot through this podcast. Um, if you don't have anything, I'll wrap up. But I just want to give you the the chance to say anything. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce off of what you just said. Yes, you're gonna get therapists that are the. How does it make you feel? That's not your style. Don't do it. It wasn't my style. I'm not the person of every time I answer something, I get the response. How does it make you feel? Um, that was actually my therapist left for a short, short period of time. I got placed with him, and then she was going to come back. And I said, "I want, I want my therapist back because we it worked so well." So, like you said, shop around, date around. You'll find the right one. Don't act tough. I did, and it almost costed me more than you could possibly imagine. Don't act tough. Realize when you're at your breaking point. Realize when you're wounded. Go get help. Don't wait until something happens or you are losing control of yourself because I will give you a fair warning. The thought process of you losing yourself or sitting there laying in bed thinking you lo- you're losing control of yourself is the scariest feeling in the world. And I'll tell you right now, it is something that some people can't get back. If you think you need help, get help. Talk to a friend. Talk to somebody, reach out to friends, reach out to family members, whatever the case is. Talk to people about trying to find ways to get help. They're all out there. It's simple. The state has them. Cities have them. Schools have them. Use them. Don't be tough shit. You're not. Just get help if you need it. Perfect. I think that's a great way to to wrap up the podcast for people that might have something that they're dealing with. And I think it's it drives the message home in a way that I might not be able to deliver it. You're a big giant guy who, and I'm more of a shorter guy. I lo- I'm wearing the pink tie dye. Like it, it might be coming off differently from what I say, but to hear it from someone who looks like a bro- blue collar worker, who's just like, it looks like a brute. Yeah. You have that per, um, physical appearance, but hearing so- you might say that and someone might receive it better. Cause sometimes it's just, we receive it sometimes better from people who look like us. And that exactly. just kind of is what it is. But I, I would just want to say thank you for coming on the podcast again and, and talking about stuff with me. Cause again, this podcast wouldn't exist with people like you willing to come on the podcast and talk about stuff. I look forward to next year. Absolutely. I love doing this. So for you guys, if you guys like the podcast, please rate, review, subscribe, share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your grandma, check it out. The Carol connection.simplecast.com also available Apple podcast, Spotify, and all the major listening platforms. If you'd like to watch your podcast, go on YouTube, search the Carol connection or at Jared M. Carol, and it should pop right, pop up right for you. And if you want to be a guest or return as a guest, hit me up on Instagram at Jared M. Carol or at the Carol connection. And we'll set that up. So till next time, guys, peace. Peace.